Hey guys, this will be video 38 for the vintage Gibson Les Paul Custom Restoration. And it will be a little bit of a continuation of video 37, which uh, I pretty much just finished a little while ago. Uh, and I kind of got to looking at the guitar, <clears throat> looking at the guitar in order to uh, prepare it for the, the, the spray booth, the paint booth. And I realized uh, there's still a lot to do. So since this is a video series on how to restore a Les Paul, uh, let's dive right back in. And um, I probably will be doing a lot of pausing in this video because I'm I'm at a um, I'm at a point now to where that one thousandth of an inch is is far more critical than it's ever been. And there's certain things if if I see that I'm at a threshold where if I try to show something show something on video, I run the risk of of screwing up something. I'm going to pause the video and I'm going to do the work, verify the work, possibly mic it, et cetera, et cetera, and then I'll start the video back up. So there, there may be quite a few pauses through this video because I got a feeling that the this video in its entirety is probably going to be about two to three hours worth of work. So um, anyway, again, let me, uh, let me verify the camera. And I think as long as I stay above the table, and roughly right in there. I've got the camera a little bit low because I think the majority of the work, I'm, I'm gonna raise it up just a bit, but uh, I think the, yeah, I think the majority of the work is gonna fall in this area. So um, I've got all this stuff over here on the, the right side of the table because I'm just gonna move it from the right side to the left and talk about it briefly because this is kind of what you're going to want to see on your table when you're when you're preparing for your paint booth. We've got our tape and you should have some sort of little taping station that you can reach over that you can reach over and press down with your thumb and tear along your uh, cowboy uh, uh, hacksaw blade. <laughs> okay, now I keep mine fastened to my table on the other side because my other table is wooden. But what I'm going to do with this one, uh, it's probably going to go off camera, but I'm just going to use my, my little quick grip. And I'm going to tape it on the corner. That my table's loaded full of crap, so bear with me for a second. You, you just want, at this point, you just want everything to be real easy access. And this is definitely a time when you probably want to turn on your music and just zone, zone out into building the guitar. So let's start from the right to the left. Uh, I haven't shown this before. A lot of times I'll keep a little coffee cup with my, uh, as my little tool holder that I'm using. And let's just run through the tools. You want your exacto knife. You want your, your, your small files that you paid nearly $20 for each one. One's a uh, cross cut and one's a, uh, oh, I never can think what they're called, a uh, flat cut. Just, it's like a machinist file. And then you want your small chisel. And obviously, you know, your little your little little pins in case you had to come in here and do a little bit of binding, a uh, little intricate work. Uh, you want to try by Harbor Freight. I think these are 2 to $4.00. Nice little magnifying glass. This one also has an eight times or a 12 times right there. So, because every now and then you're, you're going to really, you're, you're going to want to really zone in. I mean, uh, zoom in on some of your uh, binding work because you're going to be sitting here with your surgical chisel and you're, you're going to be literally really splitting hairs, uh, cleaning up angles. Because if you can clean it up under a magnifying glass, It'll be fine on stage or at the gig. Uh, dust brush, obviously, you're going to want that. And then what I do with this little piece of aluminum, uh, this I think this is either a 2,000 grit or something, 800 grit. This is for, like, doing finished boat work. I'll keep my chisels or even my razor blades or my exacto blades sharp just on a piece of aluminum. All right, next thing uh, I like using, let me just show all of them at once. Uh, and you're, you're going to be blown away when you realize, man, this is stuff that is literally laying in my basement floor or in the shop. And if you're a woodworker, you already know this stuff, but 
I got a feeling there might be one or two guys that might be looking at this that have never heard about anybody taking a piece of belt sander. This is an 18 inch for like an 18 inch handheld belt sander. And then you just cut a block of wood that you know is going to stay very straight. This either needs to be maple, mahogany, or possibly an oak if you can trust it. Uh, oak is not always uh, trustworthy. Uh, this is a Honduran mahogany that is, uh, is probably 30 years old, 25 years old. Maple is incredible for this as well. But basically all it is, uh, I think this is uh, like nine and seven eighths. And then you just, it, it's real difficult to get it in there. But this is going to be an unbelievable tool for doing uh, like, see if that's like shaping across the neck. Not that heavy a grip. I'm just showing that as an example. And then, you know, you're going to want all these just little, just little clean blocks that you can trust because we're, what, what we're doing right now, we're doing transition work and we're doing straight line work. And then we're taking straight line work and then we're transitioning back to like, uh, well, I'm kind of being redundant there, but you're either transferring a round edge into a flat edge or a flat edge into a round edge. And you'll need various tools to come in and do, you know, you're sitting there thinking, well, man, how can I blend that with a, with just a little block of wood, you know, and some scrap sandpaper. And then if you're a woodworker, you're, you're going to know, okay, do I want to hit it with 220 or 400 or et cetera, et cetera. You should know that by now, but you literally could come in with a little block of wood. You know, just make sure it's in there. And just, you could do every bit of this blending like that right there. And I, I just realized that's a good idea. Probably a lot of this stuff that might help keep me from having to pause the video. I can just take the sandpaper off and show you how I would do it. And then uh, what I would be watching for. And then, and by not having the paper on there, I won't run the risk of damaging my project because we're literally, we're at that threshold where we could, we could lose our job. All right. So just, you know, 220, 120, this, some of this is worn out, some of this is worn in, some of this is brand new. Uh, this is our uh, radius, uh, Stuart McDonald radiusing jig, 12 inch radius there. And, and I'm going to show you, uh, I'll just hit it once or twice. This is probably one of the last tools I use that really, and believe it or not, I'll even roll up onto the frets. I don't want to freak anybody out, but this is where we're turning it into a jazz guitar. Now, I mentioned this is a jazz guitar, this is a jazz guitar. What I meant by that in that last video, jazz guitars typically have a lot of, uh, a lot of binding on the fretboard because they're all decorative and they're supposed to be real free-free and pretty and all that stuff. That's what I meant by this is a jazz guitar. The, what I meant was that the work that we're doing is of master grade jazz guitar level. Now, I'll digress for about three seconds here. This guitar was designed to be a jazz guitar, a melodic instrument that Les Paul and all of those guys were targeting crystal clear notes and stuff like that. This was never intended it, from a design standpoint to be a rock and roll guitar. But, you know, kids get born and, and times change and we go from there. So anyway, uh, that's what I meant by this is a jazz guitar. The work that we're doing is similar to that of, of a jazz, jazz guitar build. All right, let me get a little bit organized here so I don't want it to be chaotic once I start doing some. No, I'm not going to do that. A lot of this stuff I'm just going to set on the secondary table, so bear with me for a second. I like the idea of having my Clifton scrapers. Uh, if you get a chance, go online. Uh, Clifton, these are made in England, Sheffield, England. Uh, man, I knocked it out of the park. I found these on eBay for like $16 and they were still in the original wrapper. These are probably like 20 years old, but if you can find a set of these, uh, the, these scrapers, uh, I'm going to be careful, but you, you could, you could use that to do like a real clean transition, uh, bind, binding leveling is what I'm saying. Uh, basically a lot of times when I'm talking about anything here, I'm just talking about doing transition work. Transitioning, transitioning wood to binding or binding to wood. And that is probably going to be your best friend when it comes to finishing a guitar. So keep it sharp. 
uh, with with your little, you know, sandpaper and your, and when I say sandpaper, uh, I would recommend like a minimum of a 400 grit on a, on like a metallic surface, like a, a piece of aluminum, keep your razor blade really nice and sharp. Um, I'll keep it here just to show it later on, but you everything that we're doing from here on out is going to be 99% visual. Uh, don't get wrapped up and caught up in, um, uh, you know, is this, you know, certain dimension, et cetera, et cetera. Just, what we're doing right now is just watching ourselves like a hawk and we're just being really careful about what, what we see and making certain that what it is that we see is uh, symmetrical or consistent or is, uh, you know, or if, or, or let's say, and I'm going to digress just briefly, or I'm going to create a what if, let's say we make a mistake. The first thing you should do is obviously stop, but the, the very first thing you should be doing is looking at that mistake and asking yourself, oh, can, can, I, can I somehow or another transition that mistake into, a, you know, a, an acceptable situation? <laughs> we'll put it that way. And in other words, can you see it? That's all I'm saying. If you can't see it, don't don't come in and start taking binding. In other words, don't come in and start taking binding off to try to fix a little scratch on a corner that you might not even be a big deal. So, I, and I didn't have any of that with this job, but I'm just saying that because I, I'm thinking over the past 20 years, you're gonna you're gonna f up, and it, it's gonna hurt. I mean, you're gonna get sick. And it's going to be right there at the, the finish line. And you're going to spend days, you know, trying to clean up a mistake. And I guess I just, I'm just saying be easy on, be, you know, be, be easy on yourself and don't be, be too hard. And just uh, sometimes chill out, go have a cup of coffee. And then ask yourself, is it really that big of a deal? Uh, and if it's not, let it go. Or either, uh, you know, or correct it. Or correct it, you know, correct the mistake. Uh, it's always nice to have a little bitty piece of real aggressive sandpaper. And I'm glad I saw this because, I, and I'm not going to let this digress, but sometimes it is safer to take a real aggressive piece. Let me back up. When I say real aggressive, we're doing finish work. Uh, in other words, if you got something that you're trying to level, don't sit here with 2000 grit sandpaper and work 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 and what you'll realize is those those different species of things that you're working on will react differently according to heat and time and pressure whereas if i wanted to level that it might be more wise to just come in with some pretty clean fresh 120 on a real firm block and go zip 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 and it's over. But if you sit there with, with a, with, and I'm glad I'm thinking of this because uh, this took me a long time to learn this lesson. But if you're sitting there with some 400 grit that's worn out and, and, and you, you see an obvious issue and you hit it, you're like, well, damn, it didn't, I didn't get it. And you keep hitting it again. And then you hit it again, hit it a few more times. And then you realize, oh my, you know what? I just, I just lost my binding from the front view trying to correct some idiotic issue over here that didn't even matter but i just i just lost my binding because i took i'm being melodramatic here but i say that because i've done this before and you're literally sitting there looking at binding that is under frets that there is no solution <laughs> you're just gonna live with that and and it's gonna haunt you like that binding on that penguin still haunts me so just sometimes it's best if you see a certain issue look at it from different or maybe when you do the repair i'm glad i'm thinking of this and i'm having one of those moments where i would have had i wouldn't have thought of this unless i was in an instructional situation where i'm trying to explain something sometimes when you're working an issue uh work it on an angle three-dimensionally so you're truly watching it, or you're realizing, well, if I'm not careful, I'm going to get up into the end of these frets. And that's far more important than cleaning up some ridiculous little overhang that's going to be filled in with clear coat anyway. So leave it that, hey, you know what, alone and just, you know, move on and chill out. So 
Yeah, anyway, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop talking about that. That should make perfect sense. But just uh, when you when you get when you see something and you get ready to tackle it, make sure you look in your peripheral vision and see what what uh, what what situation you might be getting into that might create more of a more of a problem. So I see a little bit of black right there. I'm kind of curious. A lot of this, uh, I'm probably just gonna zone out. And and then you'll 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 think I've lost my mind, but this, we're, I'm at a very critical stage. But as I mentioned in several of the videos, I have to keep reminding myself. And the only reason people would be tuning into a, to a video series like that is because either they don't know this, or they want to try something different, or they want to to look at my work and realize, oh man, that guy he he might be really good at certain things, but he doesn't have a clue. But he's he's never seen how you can take this widget and, and and do this and you don't even have to worry about that so i know there's going to be a lot of guys out there that are, that are much better than me that will trip up on stuff so if there are drop me a note let me know so you know I, my ego's on the back burner so another way another back to the, the big block you know this is just a piece of oak and surprisingly it, it's had it stayed really nice and straight and this is really good this is just in the video this is really good uh, even though it's a pretty aggressive paper, I think this might be a, a 120. Uh, this is belt. This is like a 24 inch belt sander paper, and uh, Harbor Freight, really good price, uh, good good paper, and you can use that to do transitioning uh, as well. So anyway, uh, long intro there, and you may see them hiding in the background. I'm going to hit this for about 10 seconds, and this we will never talk about tuners again, ever. But I just wanted to see. I want to see if I can get this to show. Now that I, I got the guitar stripped, is what I'm saying. Bear with me while I set this up. Uh, these uh, face washers, and jeez, uh, I should have spent more time thinking about how I would show this to you guys. Uh, man, it's hard to get a grip. All right, now I'm going to back up here and look in the camera. And it may... Oh, it wasn't. I don't know if that's going to show. Anyway, the the tuner on the right is over 19 millimeter. When, I, when it caught its first thread. Okay, so that's just barely threaded on. It, it is over 19 millimeter on the, the tuner that's on this guitar. And it's just barely over 15 millimeter. So we're looking at, at four millimeter difference between the uh, initial tuner and the corrected tuner. And we will never talk about tuners again. But that at four millimeter could make a big difference. All right, so let's just, let me, let me dive in and start doing a little bit of, uh, let me look at the camera and make sure we're at 18 minutes already and I need to stay above that and I can go as far over as that. And most of this crap that is on my table is unnecessary, but out of sight, out of mind for you guys, for the most part. And uh, let me think here for a second. Uh, let me just look at this briefly. And, and if anything, I'll just, because I don't want to forget anything that I have on my list here. Um, tools for the finished work and in parentheses, 99% visual. I've already covered that. From here on out, trust your eye and trust what you feel, but trust what you see more than what you feel. Rewind and, and replay that about 15 times. And I, I, I even I need to do that because I've got to learn to trust more of what I see. I'm real bad about going, oh yeah, it needs a little bit more, a little bit more. And I realize I went too far on the binding or something. Uh, show the final steps of preparation for finished paint and clear coat work. And when I wrote clear coat work here, it prompted me to clarify, I'm gonna see if it's in the video. This amber, what you guys see, is nowhere near, nowhere near as dark. I mean, it's about half as, as, as amber in, in person or in real life than it is on video. So don't let that deceive you. Don't let that throw you. 
and I'm, there's a part of me that's kind of worried about this. I don't know how I'm going to be able to achieve doing what is beautiful in person without everybody on film looking at it going, oh, everything was great right up to the point where he ruined that binding and it's, you know what, yellow. It, it's not. In person, it's, it's, that's beautiful in person. And only Rick, uh, and, and unfortunately at this point, even Rick has probably forgotten what it looked like in person. So I say that to say this, you guys are just going to have to trust me. Uh, and I, I think by now, hopefully you would, but uh, it's nowhere near as, as dark as that in person. All right, so let's, let's, let's build the guitar. Uh, and I'll even be doing uh, some uh, taping and all that jazz. So at this point, what am I going to do first? Uh, what am I going to do first? We're at 20 minutes. And uh, this will probably end up being close to 40, 45 minute video. Uh, after I've paused through certain things. Uh, how would I approach this? Now that I've got it stripped and I'm looking at things that had to be corrected and you can see things like this. Let me, yeah, let me just do that. Let me run through what needs to be corrected. Uh, the cover was a little bit tight. The re reveal, I don't know if you guys know what reveal is, but reveal would be if this cover was... Uh, real, real snug and real flush up here. Well, then you want you wouldn't want to turn into a rounded over edge down here. That's called reveal. You want the reveal or the transition from one a piece of flat plastic to transition into this body consistently. Again, remember w w what we're doing now is we're doing transition work, and ninety nine percent of it better be just visual. And when I put that plate up there, my initial uh, a cut work, I, I had never really gone in with a chisel and just uh, cleaned that up to make it look like the original Les Paul. The original route is what I'm saying. So basically what you're doing right now, you're, you're creating a work order for yourself. And before I forget, uh, in order to keep it from getting out of hand and overwhelming you, let's compartmentalize. And I may, I may, it may be one of those situations where I do what I say <laughs> rather than do what I do. But if, if this is overwhelming to you, let's compartmentalize it and let's focus on the neck or, or maybe let's compartmentalize the neck and let's just focus on, yeah, this is pretty good information. Let's focus on just, uh, just getting the net, the headstock exactly where we want it. And don't start shaping here and then, find yourself, you know, seeing an overhang here and you start working there because you realized, oh, God, you know, I completely forgot I was supposed to maintain one and 11 sixteenths or some stupid something. And you realize, and you're going to sound like I'm being hard on myself. It's just that I've done that. I've gotten so excited about working something from the back that I overlooked the importance of making certain that what you see on the front was not affected. So to keep this under control, maybe compartmentalize, just focus on the headstock. Yeah, this is some good information. And I think after I listen to this video in the end, this is probably going to be one of the best videos that you could watch. Uh, and before I start getting all emotional there, let me just explain what I was about to say. Um, if you know that your binding is a little bit thick or, or, or overhanging that wood uh, and you know that and you know that you do want to work the binding down that was always your original intention that's not quite the case in this job and I don't want to start digressing that's in some of the past videos I built this lower a little bit smaller so that once I start building up with clear coat and paint it'll come up to the factory original uh, dimensions. But if I know that I've got an enormous amount of overhang right here, rather than working, and this is where I'm going, this was this was where I was going to go, and I almost digress. But if I know that I've got to transition uh, this this binding to this part back here, guess where I'm going to work it from? I'm going to see if I can do this in the camera. Let me let me find my razor blade. Probably with my pick, wherever the pick is. I can lose a pick. It's amazing if it's in my hand. Okay, I've got this headstock in my, my belly. Now, it's not the most comfortable thing in the world, 
But if I know that I've got to transition, if I've got to transition that, well, I'll just do this right here. That, that, that's easier to hold. If I know that I've got to transition the back side of that binding to that wood, I'm going to work it from the front. And I'm going to just hold that up. And I'm going to watch the width of that. I'm going to cock my razor blade on that angle. And I'm just going to, I'm not even going to look at the wood back there. But I'm, what am I doing? I'm keeping a, I'm keeping a hawk eye on that width of that binding up front, and I'm making certain that I don't roll over and and mess that up. Because you mess that up, and you're in trouble. Now, do you want to come over here and start trying to tip that in? Absolutely not. And I'm watching this guitar. If I let go, it's going to slip off the table. But but I'm not even looking at that back there. But I can reach over and I can feel it. I can't catch my fingernail back there, so stop. Leave it the crap alone. But I can catch my fingernail right there. Maybe take a visual and ask yourself, well, is that okay? Because if I started, yeah, this is pretty darn important. And even if the video ended right here, this would probably be some incredible information. Know all of your transition points. Am I in the camera? Know all of your transition points. We've got, we're, this is a jazz guitar. And if you don't know what I mean by calling this a jazz guitar, this is this is five eighths of an inch thick right here, and this is nine sixteenths of an inch thick down here. It transitions from the thickness of the neck into the headstock. So by by just natural uh, woodworking, it's a little bit thicker right here. And the cool thing about it, they, they don't just have this on a ninety degree angle with the front of the headstock. It's pitched on a ninety degree angle with the plane of the fretboard and the plane of the neck. So you got you got to make the decision well do i come in here and i scrape the back edge of this off to, so i don't have that finger nail catching or do i allow the paint to build up in there it it, it all depends on it all depends on your finished line and i'm looking at that and i'm and i'm going to tell myself i think it's okay to, to leave that little bit but i'm going to hit it just once and I, I'm I, I'm keeping it cocked over on an angle because I know if I get if I start scraping up here at the top I'm gonna lose the, the profile of that binding and I don't want to start scraping and trying to transition into that why because that was never my intention anyway I know to leave that alone unless I look at it from the front and I realize uh, or maybe Let's say I'm doing a 1955 replica here and I'm hitting this thing spot on. Well, take a gander on, on all your ser online searches and you'll discover that most of the 55s, uh, the, the, th the thickness of this, let's see if I can, let me do this, let's see if I can find the pointer. This binding right here is about 90 thousandths, but on, for the 70, uh, 70, it's those tap tones. We'll talk about tap tones later. But uh, the, 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 this, this outside binding on the early 50s models is much thinner. And if, if this were my guitar, man, I, I would be cutting this down real thin. And I, even this binding up here would be much thinner. I'm not going to do that because it's not my guitar and I, I can't do. You know, three days worth of, of high, high, high end replica luthier work, uh, and it, for the price, uh, and and obviously because money is an issue, but also because it's not a fifty five, and I clarified that in one of the videos. Know what it is you're working on, uh, set your precedent and stick to it, or or you know, have have a have an end result in mind, and. Uh, you'll, in some of those past videos, I'll, I'll make the statement, is this the final call? Is this the final call? Certain things you can change at the end. Uh, like, for instance, I could take this guitar and come in and cut all that binding down real thin. I could cut the width of this binding down a little bit and even drop the width of that nut to slightly under 1 or 11 sixteenths if I wanted to, which I'm not. Or I could come in and I could carve this body till the cows come home and from 20 feet away, you'd swear it was a 50s. 
you wouldn't you, you would you wouldn't realize it. it's the 70s or 80s but we're not going to do that so anyway I, I hope i didn't digress as much as i just clarified you've got to you've got to be willing if you're building a guitar like this you have got to be willing to spend four hours just working on the headstock or you've got to be willing to spend uh, uh three hours two hours making certain that you don't f up your transition i hope that's in the camera it, it, that may i'm sorry i hope some of that was in the camera you got to be willing to spend time you know working on just the headstock or just the neck and so anyway i'll stop because that that should make sense and i, I hope i didn't get redundant there but whenever you are, are about to approach something ask yourself let me get this I dropped a piece of sandpaper that's pretty important uh, you got to ask yourself, from from which profile should I shape it? And on this guitar, it'd be best to do, and I hope that's in the video, it'd be best to do any, any shaping from the front. The guitar's trying to slide off the table. <laughs> and I can assure you, if that happened, this video would never get uploaded. So, And then you're just kind of coming. Also, uh, this is pretty important before I forget. Uh, a lot of times you're okay. Yeah, this would be a perfect example. See how grungy and dirty that binding is. I hope you can. I don't, I don't know if you can. If you can, that's good. If not, let me just see if I can get it in, in the light. See how dirty it is. Well, it's because I was doing all this sanding of this black, and I was the the black grime was getting transitioned into the white. And if I just came in and clear coated it right now, well. It's certainly not going to be white, that's for certain. And even if you shot the amber over it, you're going to see all that gray background. So you have to determine how best to clean that white uh, before you shoot the amber. Because you, uh, as I mentioned in one of the videos, uh, try not to work with like pre-aged bindings. They're so artificial looking, it's absurd. And, and at best, consider yourself lucky if you find just a really pretty cream, like a buttercream or, or almost like a vanilla cream. But always, always work with white bindings and just get really good. And, and I, I brought that up to mention the fact that um, I can't remember uh, how I'm going to clean this. I'm pretty risky. I probably will be cleaning it with a lacquer thinner or an acetone, but it will be a one, one white one one wipe process clean uh, maybe start out with the 91 percent alcohol and just see if you can kind of rub 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 and, be, and once you get that way if you got the alcohol on the black you wouldn't risk destroying the black or stuff like that so i better stop before i start digressing so uh, let's let's get back on point and let me build a guitar so some of this i'm probably just going to quieten down a little bit and just show you how i, I am going to take this off just enough I completely forgot to bring it what I meant was by doing this right here that's getting me prepared to do my amber okay and that's that's what I was going to say and then I, I ended up losing my own train of thought and I digressed when I when I make this pot or this will be a perfect example I just put some pretty serious pressure on that but I hope that's in the camera. I'm, I'm going to let this hang off the table and take a chance. And just keep a good grip on it. But uh, I'm just taking that razor blade and I'm I'm going across that binding and I'm asking myself, do I see anything funky? Don't don't hit it 15 or 20 times. You'll lose the thickness of the binding. And that's it. That's all it really needed. Uh, why? Because I've already worked this headstock about. 45 minutes before and that and I got the thing I thought you know what, I, man, I've got to I've got to put some of this stuff on video because uh, and there's guys out there that have never even uh, installed binding let alone leveled it so I hope that's in the camera I, I hope and I, I got to be honest with you I, if you got a weak stomach uh, and I'm just going to hit this. I'm not embarrassed about it anymore because I'm so thankful that I even have my left arm. But it, it, I know it's pretty unsightly, my forearm. That's what happens when you suffer from acute compartment syndrome. Uh, I almost lost my left arm, and Vanderbilt University basically put it back together and uh, had a lot of plastic surgery and stuff. But 
I laid in the hospital in bed and shot morphine for seven or eight days and literally I didn't didn't even know who I was but and I didn't even know if I was gonna have an arm when I woke up but uh, once you realize that God does bless you, you you're, you're thankful for what you have so and I, if you got a weak stomach I apologize but you know I'm just thankful to have an arm. All right, so event again, it's visual. Uh, you're asking yourself, uh, is it um, is it looking good? And what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to pause the video briefly, and then I'm going to I'm going to finish this headstock headstock, and then I'm going to start the video back up, and we're probably going to be talking about the neck. So let me pause. Okay, guys, I'll pick right back up where I left off. Uh, I worked on the headstock for probably. About 15 minutes, and uh, I found that the alcohol works best. Uh, I didn't even attempt the, the lacquer thinner. I went ahead and did the uh, fairly close to finished shape work. Is that in the camera? And uh, I just used 91% alcohol, and that's that's working really good uh, about getting the, the binding ready to be shot with amber is the reason I'm talking about using the chemical at this point. And I transitioned the uh, headstock a little bit and uh, a little bit more up here at the top. And uh, I'll just briefly mention this. The reason that looks a little bit darker is because of some of my initial primer coats. I shot the maple with a Starcast Amber, which you would use to do like a, a, a Fender uh, Telecaster type uh, Starburst and it gives a real vintage look. And I got to think, I thought, man, that would be a great way to do a relic is maybe shoot the, all the raw wood with Starcast Amber first, then shoot your black, and then sand down until you see the dark, and then it would make it look more vintage. So I don't want to start talking about that because that's, that's relic work. But you can see the, the and I'm going to go across again before I shoot the Amber, but this will just show you that the, we got the, uh, the binding ready to go into the spray booth. And all I did was work it right up to the uh, the nut the nut location, and then left alone. Now, what I'm about to do here, because I think the video is already pretty far up, but this is pretty important. So, if this ends up being uh, two videos related to uh, it's 37 minutes, if this ends up being two videos related to um, paint work, well, then so be it, because the painting is probably 30% of the entire job anyway. So what I want to do at this point, I want to do a little bit of a test because I've already done some uh, uh, initial uh, prep work from the standpoint of sanding, uh, shaping the neck. So we're, we're, we're at stage two of our uh, neck approach. We've already done the headstock. Headstock is finished. If you wanted to at this point, if you thought you might be dangerous, uh, maybe uh, tape off your headstock. Uh, you know, cover it with some just uh, uh, notebook paper, just enough to keep it protected, whatever you think might be wise. But I, I say that cautiously because be careful about chemical that might be that might run up under a piece of paper and saturate the paper, and then that chemical stays wet up on that black surface, even though it might be just alcohol, it might cause the paint to bubble up. So just basically... Tell your buddies to go fishing without you that day, and let's get in the shop, and let's just focus on uh, finishing the job. All right, and I, that's looking pretty good right there. Uh, I just kind of got a general clean. I'm going to do just a little bit of, uh, I hope that was in the camera. I moved, I apologize if it wasn't. All I did was just kind of come up and, and just, I'm just, I'm hitting this with alcohol. I just want to see what's going to happen if I shot this with a pure clear lacquer. What would the white look like? I'm glad I thought of that because that's a real that's a real great way to prep your a binding. Uh, uh, prep it as though you're going to be uh, painting it with a high gloss clear, and you're going to see every little scratch. And if you're going to shoot it with amber and kind of antique it, then you do that faux work later on. So I'm in the camera. I hope I'm staying in the camera. If not, it's, it's not very important because just, I don't know, maybe just listening to me talk, you should be able to kind of uh, know what it is that I'm uh, 
working on. And if, I, if there's something that's really critical, I'll, I'll make sure it's in the camera. Uh, and I'm kind of, I mean, this is overkill. I've already done this, but uh, checking my neck profile. Didn't really sand much of that, but, but man, and the great thing I love about the 91% alcohol, it dries almost as quick as like a lacquer thinner would. Man, you can feel, even though, you remember what I talked about, the mental mapping? I hope that's in the video. I've just got this headstock laying up on my chest, and, and you can, you're, you're just going to feel the slightest little bit of, of something that's out of place. And, and I didn't expect to find anything. It's pretty much perfect. It's ready for, it's ready for Carnegie Hall. All right, so how would I, how would I do that? Uh, well, probably, possibly with these files, but the only thing dangerous about the files are these, you know what, points down here. Man, you'll be sitting here all excited about doing this and you won't realize this will be jabbing into the headstock. And they're, they're, anyway, I, I don't want to start creating what is. So just proceed with caution if you use files. Uh, I know how to use them, and, but I usually have them in some sort of stand or I have the neck in a jig that I'm working and I've either got cardboard taped around the headstock. Probably what I would do, well, I say that's exactly what I did do. This is the same, uh, and I'll show this briefly. We're talking about frets here. Uh, after I install the frets, that's the 400 grit, and I'm going to do this because I haven't polished them yet. But basically, I did freehand this, and I just made certain that I went across it real, real slow. Maybe one pass, two, uh, maybe two passes, maybe three passes. And then I came in with like a 2000 grit sandpaper and I literally just, just buffed it. And that's what I meant by it was hilarious that uh, I strung the guitar up <laughs> and uh, it literally, the, the, the strings weren't hanging on any sort of, uh, any sort of little nicks in the frets just by hitting it literally, uh, uh, three minutes with the 2000 grader. This might be a thousand. This is called a, a, a Merka, M I R K A, uh, Abranet. Uh, this is for like professional boat, uh, finishing. Like if they're finishing a yacht where this is where they're polishing it and they're doing, this is the type of stuff they use to create those mirror glazed, uh, boat finishes. And, and it's amazing. I would find, uh, Two dollar pieces of sandpaper just laying on the ground where they had used it for just five minutes and it still had plenty of life left in it. But that's ready to play right there, and I haven't even polished them yet. So let me stop digressing. So basically, you, you would use that round side right there, and uh, I'm just going to use it on the back side. But and but just imagine if I'm using the the, the radius side. I don't want to hit it because it's finished. I've got the. I, so I'll hit it with this side. You're basically going to be, is that in the, the camera? You're basically going to be doing this right here. And when you are doing that, you're paying very much attention to only the flat surfaces. And if, you, if you're good, you, you, can, you can go across it on a little bit of an angle. But basically, we were making that transition from uh, uh, the back radius of the, the, the net into the fretboard. And I don't want to start talking about that because I, I will end up going way off the rails. So just know that you're, you're going to want a sweet transition there, but not at the expense of losing the width of that binding. All right, now I think I'm going to pause the video right there because I've talked about that enough. Now I'm going to clean that up and then I'm going to uh, come back and then we're going to talk about body binding. I'll tell you what, let me start the video up briefly, and I, I should have done this before I paused the video. Uh, after you've done your shaping and your sanding and your prep work and you're getting ready, now let's take our pretty heavily saturated uh, paper towel with alcohol, is that in the, in the video, and let's clean it up. Uh, don't, don't work it to death, but now let's kind of pull it into the headstock. 
and let's just kind of see if we, we feel anything weird. And the most important thing we're doing out right here, look how clean this, this towel it is. Sorry, uh, there's almost no dust. If this is real black and nasty and filthy, well then you should have taken your dust brush and you know cleaned it off because what you're doing right now, you're almost getting ready to pull the trigger on the spray gun. Uh, almost. You're not. I'll cover that later with tack cloths and stuff, but all right, I'm gonna, and then also you wanna flip it over and look and assess your rag, it's falling apart, throw it on the floor. Now you see the importance of putting those little pin pricks in your alcohol. Never seen anybody do that. On your fretboard. And uh, I probably put a little bit too much, but it's not enough to hurt anything. Uh, but you're just, you're looking for mistakes right now, or you're looking for like little pieces of black uh, scars or paint that you need to get off the binding. And then you're just, and then you grab hold of it and feel of it. So now I'm gonna pause the video and uh, prepare for the binding. I mean, for the body binding. Okay, guys, I'm going to start the video back up briefly. Uh, the neck is pretty much where I want it. Uh, I almost forgot I was even doing the recording. I got so zoned out. Uh, when you get to points like this, when you're finishing up the neck, you want to make certain that you've done things such as this right here. Put your Gibson USA surround up there, and you're going to verify things like this right here that it truly will fasten to the locations and according to the fact and because it was funny i forgot that yeah i need to shape i need to shave a little bit of that dimension off so that it will match the sides and the little surround screw i hope that's in the video the little surround screw was just not quite reaching in that hole so i needed to, i need i had to shift that cover forward a little bit that's one of those things that if you ship that to the client they might get confused and think, oh, crap, then, then they end up moving the thing back or they put it on an angle. So those are those detail-oriented things that you got to cover and make certain that you've, that you've addressed. All right, let's talk about the body a little bit. I'm going to show you what I'm going to be doing, and I'll just demonstrate. Also, when you strip your body, uh, just keep everything organized. Get a little box and that kind of stuff. Keep it there. Keep it to the side. Don't just throw these parts up on your uh, table. Let me see if this is going to be in the camera. That should be a pretty good view right there. Uh, what I'm doing right now, I'm actually changing the profiles just a little bit. I'm going to, and I'm going to do this very cautiously and probably stop. I'm putting some, I'm going to say pretty serious pressure because I'm coming off that, I'm coming off that platform and I'm transitioning into that binding and I'm looking at anything that might be a little bit and I hope this is in the camera yeah beautiful I just let me just see if I can just show it how pretty that is I hope that's in the camera let me just turn it so that if it but what I'm doing let me see if I can hold it and just do it right on camera uh, I, I'm taking the razor blade and I'm coming off the original slope and I'm coming down and I'm I'm putting some serious pressure into it why? Because I'm lacquer, and I'm I'm. This is this is what you're going to see when when you're on stage. <laughs> you know, this is what you're going to see when you're in your photo shoot with your with your band, and uh, stuff matters. Or either, it's funny. Rick and I were talking about this guitar. We we discovered that it came from California. And uh, the, the condition it was in, I mean, it, it's, it's been seriously gigged. I'm not talking about just because it was damaged, but when I looked at the fretboards, I realized, man, this, this is a player's guitar. So we were joking about hoping that somebody would trip up on this video and, and realize that, oh, my God, that was Randy Rhodes' guitar. That's the one he and Ozzy destroyed one night, you know, in, in Brighton. <laughs> you know, so... There's a small reward to any of those uh, of you out there that may have intimate knowledge. As long as you're honest, <laughs> uh, let us know. But it would be cool if somebody tripped. Oh, I forgot to mention, what I'm doing right here, when I'm looking at this binding, I'm, I'm studying my subject. 
and I'm transitioning what I see and what I have studied into what I have done so that as a good builder and a good restorer, uh, whether it be an architectural residence or a guitar, you can't, even the most trained eye is going to have a difficult time telling where I started or, or stopped. So I look at the width of this binding here, and then that is going to determine everything about what I do over here. Take your mental map and don't get distracted. Once you map out those dimensions, this dimension here, that dimension, I hope it's in the camera. Yeah, that dimension there and then this dimension here. And then once you've studied that, now get busy and, and go over here and start coming in here. And uh, I'm not going to do it on camera because I don't want to screw it up. But, but you want to come in here and start taking off dimension. And I mean just ever so slightly. Study what you're doing down here. Study what you're doing there. and Get that tape out of the way because that will foul you up. But we're going to start. And I'm about to pause the camera because I'm going to do that. And this, this binding is going to be finished. Or at least that portion of the binding is. And I may start the video back up and then talk about the back in the same fashion. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do to make this easy. This is a perfect example because you've got this binding right here. When I look at this binding, let me get behind the camera and see if I can make this show up. When I, when I look at this binding back here, it's, uh, I think it's like 60 thousandths. And I hope I'm not too loud. I'm, I'm right in the camera, but I just turn the volume down if you have to. But th this, this profile here is very thin. I'm, I'm talking about, I'm talking about the thickness of that outer piece of binding is roughly 60 thousandths. It's about 90 thousandths on the front. So don't take a mental map of this on the front and then go to the back. But the reason that we've got the original binding, the cheerleader that kept us in the game, she's still there and she's waiting on the sidelines. So read between the lines. <laughs> uh, look, at, look at what's going on and then just transfer what you see there into what you and in, what you installed. See, I'm thick. I'm, I'm still a little bit thick right there. I don't want to try to do that on camera because I may screw something up. But I know I'm very thick right there, so I'll be able to shape that down. I don't have to do anything below it. Because, why? Because all that's original. The only thing I added was just that little piece on the top. So let me pause. Let me pause the camera. And then I'm going to clean up the binding. And then we're going to be pretty close to being finished with all the prep work. And I know it's turning into a long video, but if you're still here, you're here for a reason. Okay, I'm going to fire the video up briefly just to show you something here. I made the statement about studying the binding in this area and then, then transitioning into immediately uh, doing the top. Well, the binding up here is a little bit thicker than it is once, it, and, it, and it gets really thick right there. And then all of a sudden it gets, starts getting really thin. Why? Because it's a handmade guitar. They were probably they were doing all this in the shop. So when you when you come out of this binding, where we where we installed our binding, I remember weeks ago when I did this, leaving that thick and leaving that high, because I knew that I'd cross this threshold in the future and I would transition this my new binding into their original, and all of my binding up here is brand new. But then I step. I did stepped work to transition into the original. You can see it if you study it, but if you're if you're if you're not looking for it, you won't be able to tell. But where I'm going this, don't worry about this being thick, or don't worry about this dimension up here. The only thing that matters is the transition that happened over this uh, two to three inch uh, area. If it went from being massively thick to all of a sudden kind of softening up. Well, then just carry carry what was going on into your work. Okay, does that make sense? I hope it does. It should make perfect sense. So I'm just going to do this on camera. And you'll see how much. So let me just do the dot job and not try to explain. And, okay, now I know that I'm, I'm pretty much getting flush with that black. So what does that tell me? Chill out. Don't. Don't, now, if I'm overhanging or if I was way below the black, then I would know to maybe be cautious about doing that. But uh, 
See, I'm right, I'm right at that threshold where if I go one or one or two cuts too much, and I'm I'm being, I'm making certain that I'm making contact with that black. Why? Because I'm not making contact with the black, and I'm not.